Hello and welcome to the Rob Burgess Show. I'm, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 220th episode, our guest is me. My first solo episode of the podcast was episode 41. The second was episode 62. The third was episode 84. The fourth was episode 117. The fifth was episode 131. The sixth was episode 135. The seventh was episode 182. The eighth was episode 189. The ninth was episode 194. The tenth was episode 200. The eleventh was episode 205. And the twelfth was episode 215. And on episode 100, I was joined by my wife and regular guest, Ash Burgess, who interviewed me. I am a 28-time award-winning journalist whose work has appeared in print, radio, online, and television. Most recently, I was editor of the Wabash Plain Dealer, news editor of Nuvo, managing editor of the Indiana Lawyer, and city editor, opinion page editor, and editorial board member of the Kokomo Tribune. I was also a reporter at WFHB, The Times Mail, The Reporter Times, Ukiah Daily Journal, and Ukiah Valley Television. Oh yeah, and I'm also the proprietor of the podcast, The Rob Burgess Show. And now, on to the show. All right, hello, hello. Welcome back to The Rob Burgess Show. It's been quite a while. Uh, It's your host, Rob Burgess, and it's me, solo episode, once again. Um, It's good to be back. You know, it's been a few weeks since I've done any kind of podcast, but it hasn't been because I didn't want to. I promise it wasn't it wasn't for lack of desire. My computer that I was uh, using to edit the podcast with uh, suffered an unfortunate uh, mishap when I spilled an entire full beverage right across the keyboard of the laptop. It stayed alive just long enough to allow me to copy off the last of the files I had on there and, and then it pretty much completely died. Um, I was able to retrieve the hard drive out of it, but as far as having a computer that of mine that could do the editing, uh, I have a Chromebook, but that's not good enough uh, for what I need it for. So uh, I do now have a, a new computer here that's uh, sitting in front of me. So uh, I am able to uh, do the editing now. So I wanted to get this out here. Yesterday, I recorded this entire podcast while I was driving around uh, on my phone, but I didn't realize while I was doing it that because my phone was hooked up to the Bluetooth in my car, instead of recording uh, the audio through the microphone on the phone itself, it recorded the terrible, echoey, barely audible microphone that is installed in the car, which is cool when it's a phone call and I want that to be an option. But when I'm trying to record a podcast was, was less than ideal and was not what I was trying to do. So anyway, there's a whole version of this episode already recorded on my hard drive that, uh, I'm not going to be able to share because the quality is just terrible and unlistenable. So, um, you know, this is take two and I'm sure it'll be even better than the first because I'm not driving and I'm sitting here in front of notes I took. So I kind of have an agenda to go through as opposed to, uh, whatever pops into my head. And it is nice to have a little bit of uh, a reference to go back to, you know, I do have more episodes that are on deck. Like I mentioned, I, I was able to salvage, uh, off my old computer. I haven't gone through the files yet to see if they're okay, but, uh, I do have at least one more and then some others planned that are really, really exciting. So I do have some good episodes coming up for you here uh, soon. Uh, the other reason for the uh, the big hiatus uh, from the podcast was I've had a lot of changes in my uh, personal and professional life that I want to tell you about, uh, and I will in the future. Uh, that's not really what this episode is about, uh, and I will do a separate episode of that. It's all good things. It's just been a lot uh, all at once, and I haven't even really absorbed it all myself, so uh, I will share all those. That's a little teaser for you for the future. Um, but I, I do have a lot of, uh, great things to report, uh, in my personal and professional life that I, I can't wait to tell you about. But this episode is going to follow more in the tradition of others I've done, uh, after election. I think this might be the third or fourth one I've done after an election. Um, the first was after the 2020 election. And then I've tried to do one for each of the, you know, the major elections that we've had here and, and kind of give a status update report. And I will get to that. And it's on the agenda here. Uh, but first, I just, because of timeliness reasons, I have to 
say something about this. So the last time I did a solo episode where I mentioned this, um, you know, we were headed for an Elon Musk ownership of Twitter potentially. Um, now that has gone through. That has uh, that has commenced. Elon has bought Twitter. He now owns it for $44 billion, financed by some other people uh, as well. And it's just been a complete fiasco from beginning to end. And, uh, you know, there was a whole debacle with uh, the verification check marks, which I just have to say, as an aside, I've been trying unsuccessfully to apply for verification for years, just years of applications being rejected. I was never meeting their standards for notability or whatever. And I felt like I was actually getting to a point where I had actually was getting closer to legitimately, legitimately earning a blue check mark, check mark. You know, I was, I was there. I felt like, and now Elon has completely let the air out, air out of that balloon um, it doesn't mean anything anymore. You can give him $8 a month and have one, and you don't even have to have a real identity, let alone be a notable figure. You don't even have to be a figure, period. You can just be, you know, whatever screen name you pick with a blue check mark next to you, and it's indistinguishable unless you click on it from someone that actually has one. And so I'm done. I don't even want it anymore. Like, that doesn't mean anything to me. Like, it's terrible that it's happened for the world, but it's like, I don't even want it. <laughs> Forget it. I'm not applying. I, I, even if I could apply, I wouldn't. And I'm not going to give him a cent of my money. So I said last time, and I stick to this, that I would leave Twitter if one of two things happened. If I had to pay for it, and if Donald Trump was reinstated. And... Well, let's go with the pain for it part. Apparently, Elon has been in talks with people around him to put all of Twitter behind a paywall. So on top of his $8 paid pay-for-play verification system that doesn't mean anything anymore, he's now going to put the free content that we produce for him unpaid behind a paywall that we would then have to pay to access, I guess. No, that's not happening. I'm not doing that. I'm not paying this guy a cent of my money, and I will stop using the service if that happens. So that's already been advanced. It hasn't gone through yet, but, you know, the the way this guy moves, who knows when that will be going through. could be any day now, honestly. The other one, Trump reinstated. So here's the thing. He put up a poll yesterday and while i was recording this the first time the poll was still ongoing and it was like you know you started out 55 yes for reinstating trump and 45 no and then it moved down to 52 yes and 48 and like 15 million quote-unquote people voted in this poll so he puts up this 24-hour poll on his site asking if people wanted trump reinstated now there's been studies done of his followers. He has like something like 115 million followers and, a, you know, a good deal more than two thirds of those are, have been found to be fake or bots or propaganda. And if the margin is that little in your poll and 15 million quote unquote people are voting on it and 70% of your followers are fake, um, you know, well, I, how much do we trust that? And what what motivation would somebody with access to a lot of paid internet trolls, who, who can we think of who might benefit from that or use that tactic in the past, um, you know, what what motivation would they have for putting their thumb on that scale? So I think, just guessing, I think Elon knew that one way or another the poll was going to go this way. He wanted to reinstate Trump. He said as much before he bought this Twitter he wanted to do it. He wanted none of the blame for doing it. He wanted to pretend like it was the will of the people. And that's all well and good, assuming that that is actually people. But 
well, I don't think we could trust that result at all, given the motivations and the amount of fake followers this guy has, uh, how easily manipulated that poll would be. So anyway, the poll won you know, out for reinstating Trump, and he did it. And as of right now, it's 1.42 p.m. Eastern Time on Sunday, November 20th, 2022. As far as I can tell, Trump hasn't taken him up on that. He still has his Truth Social platform, and he's going to continue posting there for the time being. But he know he's dying to do it. How long can the guy truly last? It won't be long. It's just a matter of time. He's got to be dying to tweet. He wants to post so bad. Anyway, I'm not sticking around to find out. So as of right now, and I posted this last night uh, when the, the results of the poll came through that I'm done on Twitter. Uh, I just, I can't, I can't do it. I can't go back to sharing a platform with Trump. Uh, he was way overdue when he was banned the first time. He should have been banned way before he became president. He violated the terms of service condition, you know, constantly. And, uh, you know, if he weren't a public figure, would have, if he was like a person like you or, or me, um, we would have gotten banned years ago. Wouldn't have made it out of the starting blocks. So anyway, I'm not on Twitter anymore. I'm not going to post on Twitter. It's just, it's a shame. It's a real, real shame because I'm guessing a lot of you that are listening to me right now heard of me because of somebody you follow on Twitter who I interviewed. I know that for a fact because some of my guests have very high follower counts on Twitter. And when they retweet a link to their episode, I get a whole new batch of listeners that I'd never had before. How I can't, how am I going to replicate that? Elon has ruined this service that was valuable to so many people, me included. I grew my audience. I had almost 3000 followers by the time he uh, bought the service. So i had been using it for years and successfully because I interacted with everyone who, everyone who interacted with my account, I followed, I gave them a follow. I mean, I didn't always keep following them if, if they were abusive or weird or like some kind of, you know, strange bot account or whatever spam. But any person that engaged with me in good faith, I was willing to give them a follow back on there. And I felt like I had a good thing going. So anyway, I'm off Twitter. It's a shame. Maybe I'll be back one day. Maybe I won't. I've left other social media platforms before. It's not the end of the world. The Rob Burgess show continues. You're listening to it right now. Anyhow, I composed a uh, link tree page, which I should have done a long time ago because it's an incredibly useful service. I I compiled all the ways that you can support the podcast, listen to the podcast, stay in touch. The main thing, if you get nothing else from this episode, I want you to sign up for my newsletter. Okay. Go to a computer right now, type in tinyletter.com forward slash the Rob Burgess show, all one word. There you'll find the landing page for my newsletter. Put your email address in the box. Click subscribe. I will start sending out newsletters starting with this episode. I already have almost 50 uh, people subscribed, and I haven't even done anything with it yet. So I'm excited to start this. I've been meaning to start this for a long time. This is the motivation I've needed to uh, push it out there. So anyway, tinyletter.com forward slash the Rob Burgess show. All one word. Go there, type in your email address, hit subscribe. Let's stay in touch. I don't want to deal with these social media platforms as far as staying in touch with people that are already interested. So thank you. Please do that. That would be great. So the link tree, okay, is at L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E forward slash the Rob Burgess show. Again, that's link tr dot ee forward slash the rob burgess show not sure why they split it up like that anyhow i'll post a link to all this in the show notes and you will be able to follow them but 
please check this out. It's a really cool page. I've got my newsletter link. There's a tip jar where you can support the podcast via PayPal. We've got the link to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. You can follow on SoundCloud. You can subscribe on YouTube. Oh, this one I just added. Follow on Amazon Music. Hello. We just got added to Amazon Music. I forgot to mention. Very proud to be asked to do that, and I just did it. And you can find it on Amazon Music. You can follow on Spotify. You can follow on Stitcher. You can follow on iHeartRadio. You can subscribe on Player FM. You can subscribe if you have an Android. All that is on my link tree. All the ways you can do that. We have the official website, therobburgessshow.com, my personal website, thisburgess.com. Uh, I still have a professional Facebook page that I don't use all that often, but if you want to like on Facebook, you go right ahead. So all that's on there. Now, I listed all those things that are on my link tree. Now, the thing I'm struggling with is, okay, I'm leaving Twitter. I said that. Put, I threw the gauntlet down before, and I'm willing to, to live by my own standards. So where do I go? So I've researched a couple of the options. Not real impressed with any of them yet, but there does seem to be some alternatives. Um, one I won't be joining is Counter Social, which seems to be run by some shady hacktivist who we're not even sure the identity of. Um, don't feel real comfortable giving them my personal information, but maybe it's fine. Whatever. I'm not going to join that one, at least not right now. So, uh, Mastodon appears to be the natural successor. I've seen probably the most people who are migrating away from Twitter as I am mention Mastodon as their alternative. I've applied for and been accepted to a Mastodon instance. See, this is the thing. We have to learn about servers and instances now. The one I'm a part of is called Newsy, N-E-W-S-I-E dot social forward slash the at sign, The Rob Burgess Show. I guess if you type that in, that you'll find me. I've set up my page. It looks a lot like Twitter. It has a 500 character limit, which is different. Um, I did a search of all the people that I follow on Twitter and that had Mastodon accounts, and it turned into like 12 of the, you know, 3,700 people I was following on Twitter had accounts, maybe 14, I don't remember, but not a lot. Also, a thing I have a problem with about Mastodon is they call their tweets toots, and instead of retweeting, you boost the toots. We got to do something about this terminology, people. I think this could be a successful platform. I don't think it's quite there yet. I don't really understand what I'm doing here. It doesn't look exactly like Twitter. It's a little different. Maybe it's good. I don't know. I don't think it's uh, anything is ever going to replace Twitter exactly. It was a once, it was a special thing when it was happening. And it was honestly the one I enjoyed most of any of the social media platforms. You know, I keep a Facebook page for professional reasons, but if that weren't true, I would have quit that site long ago. Yeah, I have an Instagram, but please don't follow me on Instagram. I'm, uh, you know, I'm not available there. It's not my, it's not my platform. I'm not joining TikTok. I don't think not interested. Snapchat passed me by. I'm not doing that one. You know, I said this jokingly on Twitter back when I was saying things on Twitter, but you know, we were, we too quick to my, to abandon my space. I don't know. I don't know. That would be if, if MySpace had continued to this day in, in a real way, and I think my profile is out there somewhere, but not really. <clears throat> I don't think you can like friend me or put me in your top eight anymore. MySpace were still a thing now, and Twitter failed. I would actually seriously propose MySpace as the alternative. Although, another dearly departed uh, social media platform, Google+, Plus. Google+, Plus could have just hold on for a couple, a couple of years after it did, they might be sitting pretty right now because I feel like they might they might have picked up that mantle. 
who knows, maybe they'll bring it back. But, like, that would have been a fallback, too. I like that Mastodon is decentralized. It doesn't feel like your breach is quite as far, I don't think. I mean, I don't really understand it at all. Uh, it's not, it's, it's not, there's not one central thing. You have to sign in via this one server that you apply to join. There was a verification process, but it was real, like, not put together looking. I submitted my stuff, but I, who knows where that went. <laughs> I see some people are verified. Like I saw George Takei already has over 100,000 followers on here, but he's George Takei, you see. I'm not George Takei. I'm just, see, that was the thing. I built my audience on Twitter organically. No one knew who I was before I started posting there. And that's another thing. Like I can post my links to my stuff on Twitter all day, but like people are staying on Twitter for the most part. I've lost a good 50 followers since Elon took over, but the majority seem to be there. So I don't know. It's a complete mess and it's a shame. And I wish he had bought a different website or none at all. Just go be rich somewhere. Why do you got to, you know, why you got to do this? All we wanted was an edit button. That's it. I asked for that for years and nothing. So it goes. So it goes as Kurt Vonnegut, who celebrated his, what would have been his hundredth birthday recently, we've said once we are now into what brings us together today for the midterm election roundup. So this was predicted because of inflation, because of gas prices, because of historical headwinds in a midterm election against the sitting party in power, a, a red wave of, you know, tsunami coming crashing down all across the country. That didn't materialize nationwide. I think it's important to say that from the outset. I think the Dobbs decision had a lot to do with that. Um, not everywhere. And, uh, really not in some places where I was told were either swing states or becoming swing states or were in the past, but not looking very swingy any anymore. Uh, Texas. Wow. Beto really got beat bad for governor. Tim Ryan in Ohio lost to JD Vance in the Senate. These weren't close. Okay. It wasn't by a couple hundred votes or anything. This was, you know, big margins. And, you know, let's get to Florida. Florida, DeSantis, he really ran the table, you know? And I think his political star is rising, and I think the Murdoch empire is trying to promote him as the next standard bearer. for the, He's the golden boy for the Republican Party, as far as I'm concerned. If he wants to go into battle with Trump during the primaries, because Trump announced, as we'll talk about more later in the episode... DeSantis, you know, I think he's young compared to Trump and I think he could wait, but I don't think he's, he wants to, or that he's going to, because I think he knows that he's at the peak of his political power right now. So I think that he is, there's no way he doesn't run. I think I could be wrong, been wrong before it's happened. But I think that Trump's ego will not allow him to be usurped. So I think they are both going to go for the brass ring. I think that's going to be ugly. And I think the best case scenario for anyone that doesn't want any of those two to be president would be if DeSantis got the GOP nomination and Trump split the ticket by running it as an independent. And then whoever the Democrats put up, be it Joe Biden or whoever, would coast to victory. So we'll see. But I would say it's more likely than not that DeSantis is going to run for president in 2024. And so obviously is Trump. And there will be a bruising primary battle that will, even if one of them wins out and the other one doesn't run as an independent, I'm mostly thinking of Trump here, uh, they will be so damaged by that fight that they might be a weakened general election candidate. I don't know. We'll see. It's early days, but yeah. Wow. Wasn't even close in those. And you know, Tim Ryan and Beto were, were real heartbreakers. Cause if you've listened to the podcast before, you know, I have a lot of criticisms 
for the Democrats as far as messaging and campaigning and connecting with voters. But I thought Beto and Tim Ryan ran admirable com- campaigns. And they just got shellacked. And I just don't know what they could have done differently. I mean, that is something I do want to explore, you know, in states going forward where, you know, it looked like a little more swingy and now it doesn't look so swingy anymore. And what, what's gone wrong and what, what's the path forward? Because I do think that they did a good job. Um, now, obviously this is not all doom and gloom for the Democrats. I don't mean to say that at all. They flipped a Senate seat. Fetterman beat Oz and, He was unabashedly progressive, I'd like to point out, and pugnacious and took the fight straight to uh, the, you know, Dr. Oz and really poked a lot of holes in his credibility, hammered him, even through having a stroke, which I thought was impressive. Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan flipped the whole, you know, state government upside down. It's all Democrat control since the first time since 1983. So that's another thing. Sarah Palin got beat again. She can't stop losing up there in Alaska. So there are bright spots for the Democrats. There's, it was a better than average night. That's if you look at the Senate and some governorships. Now let's look to the house. Oh boy. Republicans flipped it. Maybe not by much, but they did. And as if we've learned anything about Republicans, especially at the congressional level, is that they don't need huge margins to affect great change. The Democrats always seem to need a few extra seats for your, for your Joe Manchins and your Kirsten Cinemas, but not Republicans. They know how to, if Republicans don't know anything else, they know how to fall in line. What's the saying? Democrats fall in love and Republicans fall in line. I think there's some truth to that. I think it has to do with why people are Republican or not. I think if you're Republican, you're more corporatist minded. You're more willing to get behind a message and, and, and push the team over the finish line. Whatever sports metaphor you want to use. So, yeah, they did it. It wasn't fair. There was gerrymandering. We had a redistricting process that was inherently unfair in many states. And, you know, lest we forget, New York, from what I'm reading, may have cost the Democrats the House, and they tried to have redistricting reform. There's an article that I'm reading from the Brennan Center. Uh, It's called, What Went Wrong with New York's Redistricting? I encourage you to check that out. I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, basically, they tried redistricting perform, reform um, in 2014. It, it didn't really work out. Um, there was a whole process where maps were redrawn. And um, one part I want to read from you here, for, read from for you here, is a section of the, of the article titled, Democrats Choose Not to Participate in the Remedial Process. Finally, Democrats themselves bear part of the blame for the way the redrawing turned out because they largely sat the process out. After Judge Patrick McAllister struck down New York's congressional and state Senate maps at the end of March, he gave the legislature a window of opportunity to enact replacement maps. That's not uncommon. The accepted rule in both federal and state courts is that if the maps get struck down, the legislature or commission that drew the map should have the first shot at enacting a fix. The reason is straightforward. The body that drew the map will have more familiarity than a court with the complexities of a state and is better positioned to craft a remedy that addresses legal defects while balancing various legitimate considerations. And that's exactly what happened in Maryland when a circuit court struck down the state's congressional map as a Democratic gerrymander. Even though Democrats in Maryland disagreed with the court's ruling and initially decided to appeal it, they nonetheless took advantage of the window allowed by the court to adopt a remedial map that would take effect if the appeal was not successful. But for whatever reason, New York Democrats chose not to do the same, instead letting the opportunity to control the redrawing pass without an action. Perhaps hoping it would be too late to redraw the map for 2022 by the time the appeals were decided. They then took an equally aggressive line when it came time to submit 
proposed maps to the special master, offering a map that made very nominal changes to the one found to be constitutionally infirm and none at all in key areas like New York City. That was their right, but by refusing to redraw the map themselves or offer reasonable alternatives, Democrats left the door open to a more radical reworking of the map. So anyway, that's from that article. Please check it out. It's worth reading. It's worth knowing about. I've been writing about gerrymandering for over a decade. It's kind of become a pet obsession of mine uh, because it is so crazy that politicians pick their own voters and that the process isn't formalized. It changes from state to state. And if you really want to get upset, listen to This American Life, episode 784, it's called Map Maker, Map Maker, Make Me a Map. This is about the redrawing of districts in Ohio and the process by which they went to the polls in Ohio, mentioned Ohio earlier, uh, with unconstitutional maps. And uh, that was a crazy making episode to listen to. So please listen to that. Read that article. Educate yourself on this process. It affects us all. And uh, it's a really important issue that I've been beating the drum on for quite a number of years. And it's not the most, you know, uh, horse race interesting topic for people, but it's so important. So please understand how redistricting and gerrymandering is putting the thumb on the scale. In this case, because a lot of these state houses were Republican in in the hands of Republicans. Democrats have done this too in the past, as we've heard even in that article. I said that Democrats had done it too. It's just that Republicans have been more successful at it lately. And they're not interested in in changing that because they, you know, they started out this race, even though the Democrats flipped a seat in the Senate in their favor, and they may get a one more vote majority than they had before if Warnock runs in Georgia in the runoff next month. And so... You know, it's it's just inherently an unfair process, and there's better ways to do it, and we just haven't done it yet for reasons that are obvious in this country. So, anyway, it's just a really upsetting thing because Republicans have flipped the House, even though if you took percentage-wise who voted which way just by straight-up uh, majorities, uh, a lot of these states would, would have a more even congress- congressional delegation because, but because of stacking and cracking, districts and concentrating voters of, uh, you know, color in places where their votes uh, don't infiltrate other districts or by deleting that vote, by splitting them in between different districts and, and making it so their impact isn't felt quite as much and having these long snake-like looking totally, uh, you know, don't look like anything other than they're trying to pick their own voters and don't have anything. These districts don't have anything to do with each other. Uh, these maps, it's, it's just, yeah, I could go on all day about gerrymandering and redistricting, but you should educate yourself because it's a super important topic. Just a lot of heartbreaking results in the house. Boebert, Gates, Marjorie, Marjorie Taylor Greene, all reelected, heading back to Congress. Wow. Okay. And Marjorie Taylor Greene, no longer the outsider, being brought into the big tent fold by Kevin McCarthy, hopeful, uh, you know, at least for he hopes the next speaker of the house. Yeah, this is not the fringe. This is the party. Now this next two years is going to be a waste of time. It's going to be so depressing to watch all this. You know, we're going to hear about Hunter Biden's laptops and uh, how the January 6th detainees, uh, who stormed the Capitol, our political prisoners who are being mal- mistreated and boohoo. I just, I, I, you know, and meanwhile, meanwhile, we don't, we, we have a blocked student debt relief plan. Can't get that through. Uh, the child tax credit has not been renewed for over a year now, probably. Uh, there's no plans to help anybody with anything really. Just grievance, petty, you know, tit for tat, you know, they just, they're going to impeach Biden, not for any reason, just because they're going to impeach him for something. Uh, It doesn't matter for what, as long as people who aren't paying attention think it's all the same, 
because Trump was impeached legitimately twice, they're going to find some reason to do it so that the person who doesn't pay attention is just like, well, one side did it and the other side did it. And who knows who's telling the truth? You know, who can say? So that's all they want. Just want to muddy the waters enough. It's depressing. There's so many real problems that need urgent attention that could be addressed by Congress, and they're just not going to be because there's no interest on the Republican side for fixing anything. There's no future in that for them. It's if things are bad, well, Biden is in the White House, good, fine. I have no, they have no incentive to make it better. They don't want it to be better. They'll complain all day, every day, about the high gas prices and inflation, but they've got no plans to give you extra money. There's no stimulus coming for you. You know, it's just what you, you just get this steady, steady diet of fake outrage about nonsense issues that don't affect you. And that's what we're going to have for the next two years, at least. So, to be continued. Last thing I want to touch on, current event-wise. Okay, so Merrick Garland this week, I think it was Thursday, announced he was appointing a special counsel to investigate Donald Trump. Okay. I said this on Twitter when I was still saying things on Twitter, that there was a window in between the election. And a week later, when Trump submitted paperwork and formally announced his bid for 2024 where none of the excuses that I've been told for the last couple years as to why we cannot right now indict Donald Trump. Okay. So there's three reasons I've heard. You've heard them too. You could probably say them before I'm even going to say them. Number one, can't indict a sitting president. That's number one. Okay. Heard that all through the, 2016 to 2020 time frame. Sitting president can't indict them. Okay. DOJ memo, just an opinion, but you know, everyone said that, including Robert Mueller, who punted on it, said we can't indict, just took it as a given. Okay. I don't agree with it. It's your rule. We'll live by it. All right. Fine. 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 No sitting president indicted. Whatever. Okay, that's number one. Number two, we can't indict Trump before an election. And that's any election, apparently, even if it's a midterm, when he's not on the ballot and there's no presidential on the ballot. Even during that, you can't do it. Another DOJ opinion. Okay. Again, I don't agree with it. As I said, he's not on the ballot. He hadn't technically declared his candidacy. But to avoid the appearance of being political. I'm sure Hillary Clinton would like a word, especially given what happened with James Comey days before the 2016 election. Okay, they say that's their rule. Like I said, I don't buy it, but it's your rule. That's what you said. Okay, we'll go by that. Okay, so number one, sitting president. Number two, election, proximity. Okay, those are your two reasons. Number three, third reason I've heard we can't indict Trump. You can't indict an active political candidate in this country. Okay? Again, I don't agree with it. I think you can. I don't think there's any rule that says you can't. However, some people don't think that's kosher. Okay? Again, I don't agree with any of those that I just listed, those three. I think you could have indicted him any time during that time period. There's been many excuses given as to why that can't be no matter what. Okay. During the time period between November 8th, Tuesday, November 8th, 2022, and Tuesday, November 15th, 2022, none of those three things applied, okay? Those excuses that I heard over and over again do not apply during that time period. He's not the president. It's the election's over, the midterms happened, and he's not actively announced, he's acting like it, but he has not actively announced that he's running for president in 2024, so he's not an active political candidate. None of those apply. Merrick Garland saw everything we saw, including the January 6th commission, which proved that he was bilking his followers for money for a fake you know, election integrity fund. 
hello, is that not a crime? So we all saw the crimes in public, self-confessions. He can't stop telling about what he did. So pick one, just pick any of them. They didn't indict during that time because I believe at this point that they never were going to. They announced a special counsel, I believe, to let people down easy about their decision not to indict. So he can pass the buck to the special counsel, and then when the special counsel says that we can't do it for whatever reason, they can be like, well, we went through this process. What else do you want? I didn't make the decision. The special counsel did. That's what I think. I'd love to be proven wrong. There's not a Bill Barr here to shade the results. Biden is the president and not Trump during this time. I feel if they were going to, I don't, again, don't agree with appointing the special counsel here, but if they were going to, why not do it during that window that I described? Why wait till after he announces? You now give them cover. I, again, I don't agree with that. I think you can indict him anytime, personally. But if we're going to play along with their rules, these make them up rules, and we're going to follow them, okay. Active political candidate, he was not prior to the 15th when he announced. You could have still said, this is an American citizen who broke the law. We're going to prosecute them because no one is above the law, and these laws apply to everyone, no matter who you are. That is not true. I believe he's above the law now, from what I've seen. I would love to be proven wrong. But he has been committing crimes in public for 50 years. Remember that New York Times story about his taxes and inheritance and all that stuff? That never, there was no consequences for that. So, anyway, I'd love to be proven wrong. I hope that I'm wrong. I hope there's some semblance of the rule of law in this country. But I think they're just afraid. I think they're scared of what will happen if they actually bring the hammer down. But I think the danger grows if you don't. More than if you just pull the mandate off and do it. So, anyway, that's my opinion on that. Please sign up for my newsletter, bringing it back to our first topic. If you take nothing else from this episode, please do that. I want to communicate with you without social media. So one more time, tinyletter.com forward slash the Rob Burgess show. My link tree, L I N K T R dot E E forward slash the Rob Burgess show. I am sort of on Mastodon at newsy social forward slash at sign the Rob Burgess show n e w s i e dot social forward slash at sign the Rob Burgess show all right stay in touch please even without twitter we can make connection <laughs> we can do it i promise i would be back with you very soon thank you for listening and uh take care of yourselves i'll talk to you soon